Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by myself, Nicholas Kissam. We have muted everyone's phone, but feel free to send in questions. You can type in questions in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And I propose to take any questions at the end of the webinar, which is scheduled to last about an hour. Right, we've got some instructions on the screen um, about how to access the webinar, and I'll now take you on to the next slide, which is the disclaimer, which I shall read over to you. Whilst we make reasonable efforts to ensure our content is accurate and up-to-date, information and guidance in this webinar does not and is not intended to amount to legal advice in any particular case. No responsibility for any consequence of relying upon the webinar material or presentations of the webinar is assumed by lease or any of our advisors. And uh, that is our topic for today. Section 20 consultation, the law as it stands today in the year 2014. Thinking about uh, Section 20 consultation, um, that may well be the typical reaction uh, as exhibited by this gentleman being uh, plunged into the depths of despair. Um, my aim in this uh, short webinar is to ensure that you will be able to approach Section 20 consultation from now on with uh, considerable confidence and knowledge of uh, the procedural requirements. Getting to grips with Section 20 consultation uh, will uh, entail uh, a working, if not thorough, knowledge of the relevant legislation, which I've uh, posted on the screen. Uh, originally, it came in uh, under Section 20 of the Land Lord and Tenant Act 1985, uh, which enhanced earlier legislation going back to the mid-70s. It was considerably uh, broadened and elaborated upon and amended by the Common Hold Leasehold Reform Act 2002, which recast and created a new Section 20 and um, added an additional new section of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985, namely Section 20 ZA. Uh, as with a lot of these procedural requirements, the devil is in the detail, and the detail can be found in the statutory instruments. There are separate ones for England and for Wales, uh, separate uh, legislation for Wales now post uh, devolution. And the consultation requirements, England regulations were passed in 2003, came into force at the end of October 2003, and the service charges consultation requirements, Wales regulations came in round about March 2004, but they are pretty much the same. Well, uh, the original uh, purpose of the statutory consultation um, had been stated in, in one particular High Court case as uh, basically um, an intent to ensure uh, transparency uh, and uh, to empower leaseholders. That philosophy has, to a considerable extent, been overtaken. And the uh, primary protection now for leaseholders uh, is the reasonableness limitation in the section 19 of the Land Lord and Tenant Act 1985. And therefore, the whole drive and intent of consultation following the Supreme Court decision, the well publicized Supreme Court decision of Dejan Investments Limited against Benson and others, uh, is to link in with section 19 of the Land Lord and Tenant Act 1985, which may I briefly remind you, states that relevant costs for repairs, maintenance, improvements, insurance, services, and the costs of management are limited to what has been reasonably incurred for works and services of a reasonable standard. So uh, the essential philosophy of Dejan Investments Limited in Benson and others, a case that I shall uh, return to later, is encapsulated on that slide. Uh, and, and the purpose of statutory consultation is to ensure that tenants, 
uh, which includes leaseholders for our purposes, of flats, uh, are not required to pay for unnecessary services or services which are provided to a defective standard and uh, to pay more than they should for services which are necessary and uh, provided to an acceptable standard. Uh, Dejan and Benson was about flats, but one can have uh, major works to estates where the, the costs are passed on to service charges of leasehold houses served by the estate and that essentially applies in the same way to leasehold houses. Likewise, in the recent Court of Appeal decision uh, on Phillips and Francis, to which I shall return shortly, uh, it hammered home the point that the primary protection for leaseholders is the uh, Section 19 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985. And to quote from that slide, the real protection afforded by the 85 Act to residential tenants is that all service charges must be reasonable and reasonably incurred under Section 19. This is the sensible way to control routine works of repair and maintenance, which are unlikely to be the subject of a detailed plan in advance. Well, who is affected? Well, I've listed on that slide who I uh, consider will be affected. Obviously, residential landlords, both public and private, and uh, the any managing agents that, uh, particularly in the private sector, they engage, since they have to um, deal with the process, right to manage companies who have taken over the management functions of the landlord on acquisition day, solicitors called upon uh, by either side or any party to a lease to advise on the consultation process or notices served, leaseholders paying service charges uh, as recipients of uh, any of the consultation notices, and uh, recognised tenants associations who are brought into the process uh, as having certain rights and being recipient of certain consultation notices. Recognised tenants associations are either those subject of a formal notice by the landlord to the secretary of the tenants association of notice of recognition or who've been granted a certificate of recognition by the first tier tribunal property chamber. Well, the basic consequence uh, of uh, the uh, consultation rules laid down by Section 20 of the 85 Act is that they limit service charges that a tenant or leaseholder can be called upon to pay in respect of either a qualifying long-term agreement or qualifying works. I'll come on to what they'll mean in a second. Unless, so that limitation, that cap will not apply if the landlord has consulted the tenant stroke leaseholders in the manner required by the legislation or uh, as a backstop obtained a dispensation order from the appropriate tribunal. The appropriate tribunal in England being the first tier tribunal property chamber and in Wales the leasehold valuation tribunal. The um, costs itself, the cost trigger um, is based on, on estimates, and uh, those estimates required by uh, the uh, regulations uh, to be made uh, by the landlord uh, shall include value-added tax where applicable. That's spelt out in the 2003 for England and 2004 for Wales regulations. Qualifying works is defined um, in, in the regs as works on a building or other premises. So that might, as in terms of other premises, include a garage or maybe a communal gym uh, to which uh, service charges are being paid for, uh, where the contribution of any one tenant will be more than £250. So if um, it's, um, say, a block of 20 and they're paying disproportionate uh, service charges based upon rateable value or floor space or number of bedrooms, one looks at the highest contributor through the service charges to the cost of the work. And if any one leaseholder is going to have to pay more than £250, uh, then the consultation process kicks in and everybody's got to be served. 
The qualifying works, the definition of qualifying works, uh, was the subject of a considerable amount of flux and controversy in a case called Phillips and Francis, which um, found its way up to a judgment in the Court of Appeal handed down at the end of last month and basically reasserted what had always been understood uh, to be the test for qualifying works, namely identifying sets or batches of works. Uh, the um, work itself was to uh, a holiday park, a former World War II RAF base uh, that had been turned into a holiday park in the 1970s in St. Mary in Wales. Uh, substantial works were undertaken by a, a, a new landlord, Freehold having changed hands, to the holiday park with a, a consequent visiting of a, a large bill on service charge bill on to the leaseholders, uh, of whom um, there were numerous uh, in chalets on 999-year leases paying service charges. It was common ground that there had been no statutory Section 20 consultation with the leaseholders, nor had a dispensation order been uh, obtained from the appropriate tribunal. So um, there are arguments about whether £250 cap applied. The leaseholders contended that the works were one set of qualifying works and therefore they only required to pay at most £250 per premises due to lack of consultation. They were saying from end to end it was one set of works, there'd be no qualified consultation, there was a large amount of service charges involved and at the most uh, £250. It might be someone who might have to pay less depending upon the... Uh, apportionment of service charges in their lease, but essentially there would be a cap and the landlord suffering a big financial hit due to lack of consultation or the obtaining of a dispensation order. At county court level, the landlords argued successfully that there were indeed a series of works applying the traditional set tests, of which none of that series of works, which in all made up the um, works project, led to a charge of more than £250 per batch, and so uh, all the costs were recoverable, even though the total was over £250. The leaseholders then launched an appeal to the High Court, uh, and their appeal succeeded. It was the last judgment of the then Chancellor of the High Court, who handed down judgment uh, just before Christmas 2012. He took a different approach to the SETS approach and introduced the aggregating approach and said all the works are qualifying works for the purposes of Section 20. And he went on to state, accordingly, I see nothing in the present legislation which requires the identification of one or more sets of qualifying works. So he's saying one doesn't look at sets or batches. It will be for the landlord to assess whether they are on such a scale as to necessitate complying with the consultation requirements or face the consequence that the landlord may not recoup the cost from the tenant's contributions. Um, they also, um, the judge stated that one looked at it on an annual basis. Um, as the contributions are payable on an annual basis, then the limit is applied to proportion of qualifying works carried out in that year. All the qualifying works must be entered into the calculation unless the landlord is prepared to carry any excess cost himself. Well, what did that mean? Well, basically, it meant one doesn't look for different sets of works or projects, but all the works throughout one year, because the Chancellor said one looks at it on an annual basis. We look at all the qualifying works, major or minor, reactive, emergency, uh, as well as those that have been planned, and um, they're all taken into account. And if at the year's end, uh, the total cost of the work means that um, the financial impact on the leaseholders, the total cost of all the works throughout the year, meant that at least one of them would be paying over £250 towards the costs, then the consultation rules applied. There was a lot of controversy about this as, as many people, uh, landlords, particularly and managing agents, felt that this was unworkable and um, the landlords appealed to the Court of Appeal. Uh, and the Court of Appeal at the end of uh, October overturned the High Court judgment 
and went back to the status quo as saying that the limit is based on looking at a single batch of qualifying works. And um, the Court of Appeal went on to provide useful guidance on identifying what is a single set of qualifying works when looking at a series of works or one single project that might be carrying out in phases uh, or in drips and drabs that might well have been unplanned. Well, uh, their guidance is that it's uh, a, a single set of qualifying works is, a, in their words, uh, the multifactorial question to be answered in a common sense way, taking into account all relevant circumstances. But some of those factors are likely to include where the items of the work are to be carried out. If um, the uh, places where the items of work for repair or maintenance or improvement are being carried out close to each other in close proximity, perhaps more likely to be one batch. Whether they're the subject of the same contract, most likely to be uh, one batch if they are. Were they to be done at more or less the same or at different times? If being done at the same time, perhaps more likely that they are one single batch. And whether the items of work are different in character from or have no connection with each other. If they are of similar character and have some connection with each other, perhaps more likely to be part of one single batch. And the Court of Appeal affirmed that that list is not exhaustive and that it's all a matter uh, and the whole matter of identifying uh, what is a single batch of works is a question of fact and degree. The uh, 2002 Act introduced for the first time the concept of qualifying long-term agreements. It's uh, a concept uh, that had been lobbied for in particular by public sector landlords like local authorities and housing associations uh, who um, were finding the original um, Section 20 uh, legislation unworkable as it didn't address things like long-term relationships with contractors, partnering arrangements, etc. Sorry, and a qualifying long-term agreement uh, is defined in the um, 2002 uh, regs as any agreement entered into by or on behalf of a landlord or a superior landlord for a term of more than 12 months where the contribution of each tenant will be over £100 in any accounting period. So one looks at each accounting period during the term of the uh, agreement or retainer and um, if it's an agreement or retainer that goes over um, 12 months, if it's 12 months or less it can't be a qualifying long-term agreement and if during the duration of that agreement any one tenant is going to have to pay more than £100 uh, towards the costs uh, generated by the qualifying long-term agreement, then consultation applies and the consultation, relevant consultation process applies. The examples are schedule of rates contracts, there might be um, uh, for across the stock of a, a, a local authority, the housing stock of a local authority, maybe a 25 or 30 year contract with a, a big contractor with schedule of rates which may fluctuate uh, and be fixed for a certain time. Uh, professional services may be engaging a surveyor, lawyers, uh, party wall surveyors maybe, mechanical and electrical engineers uh, over a long term period. Cleaning, gardening perhaps, Utilities, uh, gas, water, and electricity supplied to an estate or to a block, and, and general maintenance, ad hoc maintenance. What is a qualifying long term agreement, and, and, and whether in a particular instance uh, a contract is a qualifying long term agreement, has been the subject of uh, consideration at a, a court level and tribunal level. Um, Her Honour Judge Marshall QC in the case of um, Paddington Walk Management Limited against Governors of Peabody Trust back in 2010 in the Central London County Court decided that a contract's not a qualifying long-term agreement, even if it could, just because it could go beyond the original fixed period of 12 months or less. So that's not the deciding factor. And that was followed up and distinguished to a certain extent by an interesting case called Pointers Court Limited against GLS Property Management Limited, the decision being handed down in the autumn 
of 2012 by the Upper Tribunal Land Chamber. And I'll take you through that particular case. What happened is the landlord entered into an agreement with the managing agents with a no specified period or term. But there was a break clause uh, allowing either party to end the agreement on a three month notice and a clause providing <coughs> the fees would be reviewable after a two year period and thereafter annually. The LVT at first instance found the contract to be a qualified long term agreement and therefore the landlord was barred from recovering more than £100 sorry, £100 per tenant per accounting period. The landlord appealed on the basis that the contract was a rolling contract and no agreement, and there was no agreement it would last for um, over 12 months. Upper Tribunal dismissed the landlord's appeal and distinguished between provisions governing termination and provisions governing duration. The Upper Tribunal found the contractual obligation to provide the services was not fixed or defined, but was indefinite. It was open-ended unless it was terminated. So because of its open-ended nature, uh, they found it was a qualifying long-term agreement and they should have consulted. So be careful either side when entering into contracts, the services, particularly, uh, say, managing agents, where may, one may inadvertently end up with a qualified long-term agreement. Approach it very carefully. There are certain exceptions for qualifying long-term agreements, where there's an employment contract, where there's an agreement in place between a local housing authority and a TMO, and indeed between a local housing authority and an ALMO, between companies within the same group, either holding and subsidiary, or between two subsidiaries within the same group, and indeed where a contract's been entered into when there were no tenants in the building when the agreement was entered into, uh, and where uh, the agreement uh, was not to last for more than five years. I'm going to point up one instance, uh, one case uh, handed down by the High Court judge. Chancery Division uh, judgment um, in uh, 2012, BDW Training Limited, and um, basically it was for the supply of uh, heating uh, and um, other utilities um, on a new development in Hatfield. Um, where a contract was entered into with the uh, power suppliers, even though it hadn't been fully built and, and the leases hadn't been granted. And they said um, there was no need to consult whether the building was not yet constructed or not let at the time of the qualifying long-term agreement. It's, it's worth reading that particular case. Uh, one other concept that comes up as well, uh, and one has to is the concept of public notice, uh, where the contract is, is going to uh, attract the, the need to go through the public notice process laid down by the Public Contracts Regulation of 2006. There is a certain consultation process uh, laid down. Basically, it's where works or the agreement must be advertised in the official journal of the European Union. It applies to certain public authorities where certain thresholds are equaled or exceeded. And that's the list of uh, some of the public authorities. Uh, the primary interest is local authorities and, and housing associations. And uh, those are the thresholds, the um, latest thresholds, which as you can see are in pounds, sterlings and euros, uh, came in at the start of this year and will apply for two years uh, up to the first, 31st of December 2015 and apply to the total contract value net of VAT. One point I'd make about right to buy leases, uh, if a right to buy lease has been granted by a local authority or a preserved right to buy lease, it's been granted by a housing association, um, it's only after the 31st day of the right to buy lease applies that uh, the leaseholder will be applied, entitled to uh, any uh, of the required consultation notices. The um, 2003 and 2004 regs for Wales um, map out the various schedules setting out uh, procedural requirements. Uh, 
it's important to get to grips with which one applies to which instance. Schedule 1 applies or Schedule 1 applies to a pure qualifying long-term agreement. Schedule 2 applies to a qualifying long-term agreement requiring public notice. Schedule 3 applies where there's a qualifying long-term agreement in place with a contractor uh, engaged to do works of repair, maintenance and improvement, and then works are done. Uh, under that qualifying long-term agreement works where any one leasehold is going to have to pay more than £250 towards the cost. Schedule 3 applies. And then Schedule 4 is about qualifying works not under a qualifying long-term agreement, and that's split into two parts. Part 1 is qualifying works requiring public notice, and Part 2 is about qualifying works not requiring public notice. Now, why are the differences important? Well, they are important for the following reason, uh, or reasons. If you're the landlord, uh, you need to understand the differences if you want to consult properly. Uh, the versions, the schedules differ in terms of the obligations on the landlord. As a landlord, you need to identify the correct version of the process and follow the specific rules to ensure you do not make a costly error that could possibly result in a failure to recoup the costs for the work or contract. And if you're a leaseholder, understanding which version of the consultation requirements applies is key to understanding what rights you have available. I'm uh, going to try and outline in the next few slides some questions which will help you identify which version of the process applies. The first question to ask is whether the cost limit of the proposals of the landlord trigger the need to consult at all. The cost trigger for qualifying works is more than £250, including VAT, for any individual leaseholder. And the cost limit for qualifying long-term agreements is more than £100, including VAT, for any individual leaseholder. If the cost limit to consult had been triggered, the next thing to establish is whether the specific proposal from the landlord is for work or to enter into a qualifying long-term agreement for services. Uh, answering this question will narrow down the versions which may apply through a simple process of logical deductions. And I, on that slide, I've split up the applicable schedules for work and for services. And then the final question you need to decide is whether the overall value of the contract or agreement triggers the public notice requirements. The answer will then determine which one of the remaining versions applies in your particular case. And I put up on screen the core section 20 model. Um, and it's uh, in most instances, but not all, not all schedules, it's in three stages. The notice of intention is basically what's the work about, why is well, the, the contract about, why is the contract necessary, reasons for it, and uh, in some instances giving a right to nominate uh, and a right to comment, nominate contractors and a right to comment on proposals. Tenders, estimates, whatever, are, are gathered in and they're pro then, then provided to the leaseholders, either estimates or proposals, with a, a right for the leaseholders to comment. And then a final stage, which doesn't apply in all cases, is notification of the contract entered into and reasons why. Now, the most common process, particularly for private landlords, is Schedule 4 Part 2, which, may I remind you, uh, is for qualifying works not under a qualifying long-term agreement and not requiring uh, public notice. I'm going to take you through the various stages uh, because it encapsulates most of what's the relevant stages. Um, they're in four parts. There's uh, entailing two, sometimes three notices. First is a notice of intention to do the works. Next is the process of seeking estimates. Following that, notifying uh, the appropriate persons, leaseholders and tenants associations about the estimates. And finally, in certain circumstances, sending out a notice stating the contract's been awarded and the reasons why. 
Well, the notice of intention to do the works is sent out by the landlord or any managing agents that perhaps that they engage, stating they intend to do qualifying works and it's sent to each tenant. And where there's a recognized tenants association, I'll call it an RTA, representing some or all of the associate tenants to the association. Presumably the contact point will be the notified secretary of the association. And that notice will describe, and I highlight in general terms, that's what it says, general terms. It doesn't say you have to go into great detail or provide a specification. And describe in general terms um, the intended works or specify a place and hours at which description of those intended works may be inspected. It should also state the landlord's reasons for considering it necessary to carry out the proposed works. So you've got to justify it and basically go beyond just saying, well, it says it in the lease. It's got to be a bit more than that to to pass muster. The um, it's all in the interest of transparency, particularly uh, the reason for uh, providing the landlord's reasons. That notice must in turn invite the recipients of the notice to submit observations in relation to the proposed works, where they're to send them and the deadline for doing so. And I'll come on to the deadline in a second. The uh, notice should also invite each recipient within the uh, deadline to uh, name anybody, submit the name of anybody, any contractor perhaps, uh, from whom the landlord should try, at least make an effort to obtain an estimate for carrying out the proposed works. Now the deadline, the relevant period for um, sending in the observations on the proposed works and submitting the uh, any names of any contractors is the period of 30 days beginning with the date of the notice. And um, there was a case um, towards the end of last year, Trafford Housing Trust Limited against Rubenstein and others, um, decision handed down by the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber, which stated that the 30 days is the date uh, runs from the date the notice is served on the respondent recipients, not the date you know, on the notice itself or the date it's put uh, in the post. And, and the tribunal stated that the fundamental purpose of the notice of intention is to inform, i.e. to notify the recipient of certain matters, and that a piece of paper headed notice is of no value to a recipient before it's given to the recipient. So therefore one goes by the date the notice is received, either deemed or actual. The, where the notice, rather than giving a general description, says the description is available at a certain place for inspection, then the place and hours so specified must be reasonable. And if the description of the proposed work um, has got to be available free of charge at that place, so one can't be charged uh, for turning up and having a look at it, although any management fees uh, attended upon making the description available may be recoverable through the service charge, uh, but the description must be available at that place and during those hours. And um, hopefully there'll be copying facilities available to be taken at those times when the description is available for inspection, but if not, <clears throat> then on request from the tenant, the landlord, or their agent should provide a copy of the description free of charge. There's a duty to have regard to any observations made by uh, any tenant or recognised um, associ tenants associations, RTA, uh, within the relevant period. So if they're sent in within that period, there's a duty to have regard to those observations. There's new duty to have regard afterwards to any observations sent in afterwards, but I think it's good courtesy to have regard and maybe respond to them as well. I couldn't locate any um, decision at an authoritative level about what have regard means, but I've uh, put on that slide an excerpt from Woodfall, paragraph 7.198, Woodfall being one of the leading uh, 
uh, textbook, several volumes on landlord and tenant law. And it says, the landlord is clearly not bound to adopt such observations. He is not, however, free to disregard them entirely. It is thought that he is obliged to consider the observations in good faith and to give them such weight as he thinks fit. <coughs> Provided he comes to a conclusion to which a reasonable landlord in his position could have come, he will have complied with the statutory requirement, even though a reasonable landlord might equally have reached a different conclusion. There is then the process of actually seeking estimates, and they should, the landlord should try to obtain estimates from anybody nominated by at least one person, nominated by one tenant, or, or any one person nominated by the association. Um, and there are rules um, about um, from whom estimates should be obtained, whether there be multiple nominations or several nominations uh, by um, the um, tenants or uh, the RTA. And um, if that situation comes up, uh, the um, process um, should be looked at in the regulations. Then two documents have to be sent out. One's called a paragraph B statement to each tenant and uh, any RTA, and another one is an accompanying notice, which usually go out at the same time. So the paragraph B statement and a second notice, we'd call it a notice of estimates. The um, landlord shall supply uh, free of charge, the, the statement, that's the paragraph B statement, so at no cost to the leaseholders, uh, no direct cost anyway. And with regard to at least two of those estimates, um, it should state the amount specified in the estimate as the estimated cost of the proposed works. So, I mean, you could put in three or four, uh, basically putting in the cost, but there must be at least two. And where the landlord has received observations in response to the notice of intention, then within the paragraph B statement itself, the landlord should put a summary of those observations and of any responses made to those observations. Where the landlord's obtained an estimate from a nominated person, that estimate must be one of those to which the paragraph B statement relates. So it's got to be, uh, you know, at least two, and one of those at least should be um, the um, one obtained from a nominated person if they have indeed uh, tendered. What's important is all the estimates must be available for inspection at a specific place and time. And at least one of those estimates must be that of a person wholly unconnected with the landlord. What does that mean? Well, there's no exhaustive definition of what connection means. But the idea is plainly to increase transparency of the consultation process. The legislation states that certain relationships are deemed to be a connection. And on these succeeding slides, which you can look at at your leisure, I set out what a deemed connection is, some of which involves close relatives, and um, that slide lists who are close relatives. The paragraph B statement has to be supplied to, and the estimates made available for inspection by each tenant stroke leaseholder and the secretary of the RTA if there is one. And I said that in addition to the paragraph B statement, there's a second notice, a notice of estimates that has to be served. That's a written notice to each leaseholder, stroke tenant, and any uh, RTA, which specifies the place and hours at which the estimates may be inspected. As with the notice of intention, inspection description, reasonable place and time, should be copying the facilities available, if not they are then at the tenant's request, the landlord should supply copies um, free of charge. And um, that notice should invite the making in writing of observations in relation to those estimates within the appropriate period and specify the address. It's called the relevant period. It's 30 days, as with the notice of intention. 
where within the relevant period observations are made in relation to the estimates by an RTA or as the case may be any tenant, the landlord shall have regard to those observations and um, uh, doubtless that um, excerpt I read earlier from Woodfall uh, would apply to uh, observations in respect to the estimates. There's a duty on entry into the contract, uh, although it doesn't apply in two circumstances, where I'll come on to in a second. Uh, that duty is basically within 21 days of basically entering into the agreement, the contract, giving written notice to each tenant and RTA, and that notice should state the landlord's reasons for awarding the contract or agreement or specifying a place and hours at which a statement of those reasons may be inspected. And where they've had observations on the notice of estimates, on the estimates themselves, uh, within 30 days, the relevant period, the period in which you know, those observations submitted, they're required to have regard to those observations, um, that notice, the notice of award of the contract, should summarise those observations and set out any landlord's response to them. Again, when it comes to inspecting the uh, statement of reasons for awarding the contract, um, it should be a reasonable place, reasonable hours, copying facilities should be available, and if not, then uh, on the tenant's request, the landlord should supply copies uh, free of charge. There is no need to serve uh, the notice of contract or notice of reasons uh, where the contract's been entered into with a nominated person or uh, that it's in, uh, entered into with the contractor who submitted the lowest estimate. Strange rule, but that's what it says in the regulations, um, because the nominated person or the lowest estimate uh, may not be the best one. And in, this, you know, in, in any event, the tenants, I would have thought, the RTA should be entitled to reasons why the contract has been entered into anyway. But those are the exceptions. I think it's good practice anyway to send out a notice of, of, of award of a contract, even if uh, the legislation doesn't require one. Just to remind you of the core section 20 model on that slide. Um, and I may also state that if you're looking for the procedural requirements, not just those that I went through just now for Schedule 4, Part Paragraph 2, Qualifying Works, but for uh, all the other uh, potential contracts under the different schedules, uh, we've got precedent notices uh, in, in a guidance note that we issue and that was praised by the Upper Tribunal in the Dejan uh, against Benson case, uh, as is clear from that slide. That slide basically encapsulates the differences between qualifying works and qualifying long-term agreement, the procedure. Um, if you look at the five versions of the Section 20 process carefully, you, you, you would see some symmetry. Um, and I put on that slide the first two versions of the Section 20 process. That's versions for qualifying works and qualifying long-term agreements. I'm not going to focus too much on the detail. Uh, you can add to your knowledge of the detailed requirements. Uh, now you've got an understanding of the overall free framework by looking at the notices in the booklet, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, these two versions are the most onerous on the landlord in the terms of the requirements of the three stages and also provide the leaseholder with the most extensive rights outlined in the core model. At the first notice stage, the leaseholder has the right to nominate and the right to make comments through written observations. The right to response is provided in the form of a summary of responses. At the second notice stage, the landlord must provide at least two estimates for proposed contractors. There is an emphasis on the landlord providing clear information on the likely costs. Although um, it's worth mentioning that local councils um, 
do experience difficulties complying with the cost information under qualifying long-term agreements. And uh, there is what was described in a case involving London Borough of Southwark, um, a cascade process for qualifying long-term agreements, whereby in respect of costs, one provides first a relevant contribution, you know, I estimates of the relevant contribution of the leaseholder. If that's not reasonably practicable, um, um, then um, an estimate of the total expenditure on the building, and if that's not reasonably practical, then the unit hourly or daily rate. Once again, the leaseholder has the right to make comments through written observations, and the, the right to a response is uh, provided in the form of a summary of responses. The third stage requires the landlord to justify his selection of the contractor uh, they have gone with. As you'll recall, the landlord is not required uh, to do so if uh, they decide to select a contractor nominated by a leaseholder or RTA, or if they go with the uh, lowest estimate. So on to the next pair of similar versions of the Section 20 consultation process. Um, qualifying public notice. Uh, qualifying works public notice against qualifying long-term agreements public notice. Bit of a mouthful, but you may as well familiarise yourselves with the terminology used in the regulations. Just on a superficial look at the table, you can see there is a whole stage of the three-stage process missing, as a contractor is in place already. At the very least, it means that there are less requirements on the landlord in these two versions. Uh, from the first stage, you can see that. Due to the requirement on the landlord to tender the work according to the European procurement rules, the ability of the leaseholder to nominate is lost. I can only guess the rationale is that the significant value of the tenders makes a meaningful nomination by uh, a leaseholder difficult. Uh, either that or it is believed the leaseholder's interests are protected by the public notice framework. There's still the ability to make comments and expect to receive a response, this time an individual response. At the second stage, it's more limited in terms of obligations on the landlord. There's no comparison of estimates is required. The landlord simply has to inform the leaseholders of details of the contractors they have chosen to go with. There's still a requirement on the landlord to provide a clear picture of the leaseholder's likely costs, but in most other aspects, these two versions of Section 20 are limited in terms of the leaseholders to have a real impact on the selection. Now, outlined in Schedule 3 is qualifying works carried out uh, under the qualifying long-term agreement. This is the last of the five versions of the Section 20 process. And out of all the versions, the most limited in terms of obligations for the landlord and the rights given to the leaseholder. There's a rationale in limiting the amount of consultation that takes place in this situation, and that is that the landlord will already have previously consulted in respect of the qualified long-term agreement. The net effect of this is that there's no right for the leaseholder to nominate a contractor. The leaseholder will still have the right to make comments through the written observations in respect to the reasons behind the work and the extent and estimated costs of the work. However, the ability to effect the selection of the contractor is non-existent. Uh, there's also a right to an individual uh, reply uh, within 21 days of receipt of any observations. So just to remind ourselves of the consequences of not co consulting. Basically, service charges are limited. Um, in respect to qualifying long-term agreements or qualifying works unless the procedure is followed or a dispensation order granted by the appropriate tribunal. So it's capped at £250 per leaseholder for qualifying works and, uh, well, per premises, I should say, um, and it's capped at um, £100 per premises uh, in respect of qualifying long-term agreements, that's £100 per accounting year per premises. Dispensation order. Uh, what is it? Yeah, I suppose it could be regarded as a get-out-of-jail card, but it, it should still be treated with uh, appropriate gravity and seriousness. Basically, an application can be made to the appropriate tribunal to dispense with some or with any or all of the uh, procedural requirements, both in relation to qualifying works or a qualifying long-term agreement. And the tribunal 
can make a determination if they're satisfied uh, that it's reasonable to dispense with the requirements. Traditional reasons why one would see dispensation is if the work is, word, uh, work is urgent um, or one is, uh, particularly wants to enter into a utilities contract with short-term fluctuating prices that can only be hold for uh, a certain short period where cannot, one cannot obtain two estimates because you'll recall in the paragraph B statement one, one must supply uh, or summarise information of these two estimates or where there's been mistakes in the consultation process, perhaps where a tribunal has uh, upheld on a Section 27A application challenging payability of service charges that, that there has, uh, it hasn't been followed properly uh, and uh, for major works uh, it's going to be capped at 250 and for QLTAs capped under pounds per accounting period in seeking dispensation. The application form, you can download it from our website. Um, there'll be a different application form for Wales, where it's still the old leasehold valuation tribunal, but from 1st of July last year, it became the first tier tribunal property chamber. The one for England is leasehold five. Make sure it goes to the appropriate regional office for the building in question. Um, it might end up as a paper determination. Try and get in as many people as if you're the landlord or managing agent, try and buy in as much support and agreement from the leaseholders as possible, particularly for urgent works. If it goes if it goes to a full scale hearing, uh, either it'll be in the fast or the standard track, uh, depending upon the uh, complexity of the facts and issues. And um, well, it includes a copy of the lease with the application and setting out the grounds for the application. The fee is based upon the number of dwellings involved, presumably it's one block and that block, and there is um, an, a, a space in the uh, form to seek waiver of fees if the um, applicant is in receipt of certain means-tested benefits, although since the application can only be made by the landlord, the dispensation application, I'm not sure if they'd be uh, in receipt of any means-tested benefits, but maybe somebody could prove me to the contrary. The leading case on dispensation, I'm not going to go into it in any detail uh, because there's been a lot of commentary about it elsewhere and you can see a full account of it in an article that I've written on our website, but suffice to say uh, it was a long-awaited judgment handed down by the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court, on the 6th of May last year. It involved um, flats above shops seven flats above shops in Muswell Hill, London, N10. Five out of the seven uh, paid service charges. Landlord wished to carry out major works, costs of which would be loaded onto the service charge. First notice, the notice of intention served. The work costed at around £400,000. I think it's originally, uh, they wanted, eventually, uh, they're going to be billing on all five, 280000 Tenders received, but only one was given to the leaseholders. The landlords served the notice of estimates and the leaseholders insisted on seeing all the estimates. The second notice of estimates was served a month later but all the estimates were still not provided. But notwithstanding that, there would be an indication that turned out to be wrongly just before a pre-trial review uh, that the contract had been placed even though all the estimates had not been made available. So the uh, consultation process had been curtailed. There had also been um, other uh, mistakes in the uh, uh, following the procedure, such as not providing a summary of observations and responses in respect to the notice of intention. So there had plainly been a failure to consult. So a dispensation order would needed or recoverable costs would be capped at £250 times five. Application was made for dispensation. It was declined by the Leasehold Valuation Tribunal, the predecessor to the First Tier Tribunal Property Chamber. It was declined uh, on appeal to the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber. It was declined on appeal to the Court of Appeal. And then it went to the Supreme Court, where before a five-judge uh, panel, by three to two, the Supreme Court found in favour of the landlord and awarded dis dispensation. Uh, but on terms. What they said, and I go back 
to the very start of this webinar when I conveyed the overriding philosophy of the um, Section 20 following the handing down of the, the Dejan and Benson judgment, the principal focus of the tribunal is to make sure tenants are protected from paying for inappropriate works or paying more than is appropriate. Basically, the burden of proof, the onus, is on the tenants to show, to establish to the satisfaction of the tribunal on a dispensation application that they've been prejudiced by the failure to console. If they do, then uh, the legal burden then shifts to the landlord to rebut it. The, interestingly, the Supreme Court said it, it was not binary. Uh, it, it, until then, it, it was thought that it was binary. You either got dispensation or you didn't. The, the courts, Supreme Court said dispensation can be granted on such terms or conditions as the tribunal thinks appropriate. And they could include a reduction in recoverable service charges or, if thinks appropriate, payment of the tenant's reasonable costs incurred in connection with the dispensation application, presumably um, maybe lawyers, surveyors, barristers, maybe accountants, uh, that they engage to deal with a dispensation application uh, and to explore and test and investigate the arguments of relevant prejudice. Um, and uh, in this particular case, the service charges were reduced by £50,000 uh, because that was an offer that had been made by Dejan to um, the uh, leaseholders in question uh, at the, uh, during the course of the initial LVT proceedings. I'm going to draw to your attention uh, an interesting case um, where Dejan and Benson was applied in respect to two particular breaches, uh, which I'd call the access breach and the summary breach. And I'm going to go through it briefly. It was a case OM Property Management Limited uh, of this year. For in respect to the access breach, four estimates were received, but access was provided to all, only two of them. Access was not given to the two highest estimates. You'll recall that the uh, leaseholders are entitled to see all the estimates. And the summary breach, um, well, they basically failed to summarize in the paragraph B statement of estimates, written observations to the initial notice of intention and the landlord's response to those observations. What did the upper tribunal decide? Well, they decided that in respect to the access breach, the tribunal found there was no evidence that the extent, quality, and cost of the works were in any way affected, and that there was no evidence that any leaseholder took the opportunity to indeed inspect the material made available. And indeed, no leaseholder requested copies of the tender documents. What did the upper tribunal decide in respect of the summary breach? Well, they said that there was no evidence of relevant prejudice. And to quote, they said, it's not a freestanding objective of the statutory consultation regime to promote confidence amongst tenants that their views are being listened to. A well-conducted <coughs> consultation exercise may very well encourage confidence amongst leaseholders in the process itself and in the management of the building, and the nurturing of such confidence is not a statutory objective, and there is no provision in the 1985 Act for leaseholders to be relieved of their liability to pay service charge on the grounds of incompetent or inefficient, inefficient administration, which has not caused demonstrable prejudice. So uh, the Upper Tribunal awarded dispensation, and following on from Dejan and Benson, they did it on terms. Namely, the landlord pays the sum of nearly £7,000, including VAT, relating to the cost of instructing counsel incurred by leaseholders participating in uh, opposing the dispensation application. And the other condition was the landlord shall not include in the service charge its costs of the appeal or the dispensation application made to the uh, LVT. So in conclusion, it, it's for the leaseholder to show real prejudice has been caused by non-compliance and the dispensation can be granted 
on terms as per the Dejan and Benson Supreme Court judgment. Are there time limits on the notices? Well, the legislation doesn't lay down any time limits on the notices, but one case that is worth uh, reading, I'm not going to go into detail now, is, and I don't know if I've pronounced it correctly, Jarzemski against Westminster City Council, uh, where basically they uh, reaffirm there's no time limit between serving the notice of intention and undertaking the works themselves. However, the relevant time periods for the work to be undertaken is months rather than years, and there's a likelihood that the notice might be found invalid if there is a big gap between service of that notice and the starting of the works. Likewise, in respect to the general description, uh, I draw your attention um, in the time available to Southern Land Securities Limited against Hodge, where uh, the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber uh, last year stated that it's a question of fact and degree whether a notice sufficiently describes in general terms the works to be undertaken or contract to be entered into. Uh, what happened there in this particular case is that uh, additional works was, were done. It was a very broad description of what was intended. It didn't go into detail, uh, but as is required, a general description in the, in the initial notice of intention. When the work was done, additional work was done. Uh, the landlord said well, that additional work was embraced by the general description of the notice of intention. Uh, the upper tribunal said no, um, you didn't envisage it. it you, you didn't intend to do it. It was clearly work that could have been done. It didn't take you by surprise or was emergency unforeseen work, uh, but it, it seemed that the work that was foreseen, it was work that you could have had in contemplation and embraced by the notice. And finally, um, to conclude, I draw your attention to some useful cases. There's lots of useful cases. We've got a webinar uh, on um, important case law on section 20, uh, which please feel free to buy, and doubtless we'll do another one uh, in due course, and maybe in the next few months. Um, first one is Hannam against London Borough of Newham. Here, uh, the, it was um, uh, qualifying long-term agreement, so no, sorry, qualifying works uh, under requiring public notice, and um, what should, should have happened is the notice, the public notice, go out uh, after the notice of intention was served, but it was the other way round. But dispensation was granted anyway. Um, the, it predated, it was a 2011 upper tribunal case, and it predated the Supreme Court judgment in Dejan and Benson, but they, uh, they looked at it on the issues of prejudice, and I should imagine it would have come to the same uh, conclusion, and it, it, had it been heard after Dejan and Benson. Paddington Walk Management Limited against Governors of Peabody Trust stated that window cleaning would not be regarded as qualifying work. So I think that's the only case that's actually, um, to my knowledge, stated what isn't qualifying works. Um, and finally, there's a case under the old Section 20 that I bring to your attention, and that's about uh, making um, uh, estimates available for inspection at the managing agent's office where there was a, a difference, a big distance between the agent's office and, and the block of flats in question and there was a, um, an elderly demographic uh, in the block. Worth reading all those cases uh, as well as is worth looking at um, the uh, cases I've mentioned previously. And um, how would one, should one, I've encapsulated in that slide, few thoughts on approaching consultation. What's the prudent approach? Think ahead, stock condition surveys, what, what's intended to be done, what work you foresee, get all your systems in place, uh, be careful what you put in as reasons for the work being done, um, maybe run it by the lawyers, um, make sure everybody's on board uh, in, in management terms in, uh, and aware of the risks of non-compliance, Although it's popularly assumed, that's rightly so, that, that Dejan and Benson have made it easy to get dispensation, that doesn't mean one should take a, a blasé, casual attitude to the consultation requirements, because one suspects that the more serious the breach, perhaps more easier uh, for police officers to establish relevant prejudice, and at least uh, 
maybe a fair bit knocked off the service charges as a condition for granting dispensation. But also regard it as, as holistically as an opportunity to engage with leaseholders. Just repeating that slide to remind you about the praise heaped upon our guidance note with useful precedence. And may I remind you finally that we've got more training coming up, and um, including next Tuesday, 25th of November, there's a webinar uh, that I'm doing actually on varying leases. Um, and we're going to cover topics such as why vary the lease, varying variation by deed, grounds for going to the appropriate tribunal for variation of the lease, majority application to the tribunal, the contents of a tribunal application, what possible tribunal orders can be made and compensation awarded, and the unfair contract terms in Consumer Contracts Regulation 1999. As well as leasehold, we deal with park homes, and um, this course um, that we've got coming up, we've got some classroom training in Manchester by a couple of my colleagues on the 25th of November, and it's going to be about the Mobile Homes Act 2013, which uh, was a major piece of legislation to for the park home sector. And then we've got m more classroom training, this time in Wales, by my uh, colleague and advisor based in Wales, Christopher Last. It's on service charges. Um, I'm mainly engaging with the Welsh regulations and the, um, the leasehold valuation tribunal in Cardiff. And it's uh, to, as I say, it's a d detailed analysis of service charges in residential leases and outlines the steps landlords or their agents are required to take in order to recover charges in an efficient and effective way. Now, we've had some questions on this webinar, and I'm going to have a look at them and go through them. Can a Section 20 be served by email under any circumstances? Uh, I haven't seen any tribunal decisions on this uh, at a higher level. I think it's a risk, email. Email serving crucial documents and notices is a risk by email um, because it can often disappear into the ether. Uh, can it be served by email? I, I'm going to be agnostic on that. Uh, what I'm going to say is, is send it by post. Uh, that, that's my advice. Is service by post to correspondence address adequate, i.e. no physical service to the demised address? Well, first one would have to look at the lease and see whether the lease um, provides for deemed service uh, at the address. Uh, it um, may have certain uh, information in it uh, about service of notices. If that lease does have information about service, of notice or provisions about service of notices, then uh, it's arguable that that provision extends to Section 20 notices, and it might say it's deemed service to uh, send it to the um, flat address. It might uh, indeed incorporate um, the uh, notice provision of the lease might refer directly to the um, Section 196 of the Old Property Act 1925, which to my recollection refers to the last known uh, residence, uh, last known abode or place where carrying on business, uh, which may well be a correspondence address uh, where the flat say is being let out, um, where that address has been notified to the uh, landlord. Otherwise, um, notices should be served uh, every address that you've got for the leaseholder. Um, so if they're letting it out, send it to the flat, but also send it to the correspondence you address that the, the, the leaseholder has given to you. And likewise, uh, leaseholders, any leaseholders listening or any uh, solicitors, etc., uh, advising leaseholders should make it clear to their clients that if they're letting out their flat, to clear they've acted on a conveyance, on a, on a buy-to-let, that um, they should ensure that the landlords 
and or managing agents know of the correspondence address for service of notices and, and any other crucial documents by the landlord or to enable the landlord to get in touch with them in case of emergency. Does the estimated cost of the work in the Section 20 notice, does it need to be the cost per leaseholder or the total cost of the works? Well, it's actually, what talks about cost per leaseholder, it's really cost per flat. Uh, it talks about tenant or tenant, so he, that's in case the flat is owned in, 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 in more than one name. Uh, it's um, the estimated costs of the work in the Section 20 notice. Um, the total cost of the works used to be the criteria under the old Section 20, but now um, under this Section 20, I don't know why I call it the new Section 20, because it's been in force for over 11 years, but, but in the 2003 breaks, it, it's all about the financial impact, the relevant contribution of the, um, the flat stroke leaseholder. You know, if it's over £250 uh, towards qualifying works, as defined in the SETS approach with the Courts of Appeal decision in Phillips and Francis, then it applies. We have recently applied for dispensation for some urgent roof works. We've received a conditional a dispensation order conditional. Um, seems to end there. I don't think that's a question or just, just informing me. Um, I don't know what it was conditional on. Maybe there's more to that question as I go down. We're a managing agent undertaking Section 20 process for roof repairs. Uh, can we apply to the first tier tribunal to make an order that the estimate we go for is the best one and therefore can't be challenged? The reason for this is that service charges in arrears and we have to pay first and then recover from the leaseholders. We don't want to dispense with Section 20. I don't think you can go for an order just saying this can't be challenged. You could go for a Section 27A um, application. Um, you haven't said it's urgent, so I presume they're urgent, but you want to recover, yeah, they're not urgent, but you want to recover the cost and you don't think um, from a particular leaseholder or leaseholders that they're not going to, to get, from, you're not going to get the money from them. Um, and I can see you don't want to dispense with Section 20. Uh, if you want some assurance that you're going to cover the cost, then a Section 27A application in, in respect of the, um, the, the specified roof repair works. One can apply for an, for an advanced determination as to whether the, uh, the, co the costs involved for the roof repairs are payable and or reasonable. It, but um, it's open to question whether once the works are finally done and a final bill done, whether even if there's been a, a ruling, uh, a previous determination, whether the leaseholders can have another bite of the cherry uh, and um, raise a Section 27A application after the, the roof repairs have been done and, and further billed. On the cost of the application not being put through the service charge, no application or indeed any comments were made by the leaseholder and, the, and there was no FTT hearing. Would you agree this is a backdoor Section 27C, 20C order is wrong in law and the FTT has now right under Dejan to make a conditional order where it is stated that the procedure followed did not prejudice leaseholders? It's an interesting one. I'm happy to um, speak to the... Um, I've got their details to speak to the person who's raised that one. I, I'm not really going to go into, uh, you know, the rights and wrongs of a particular order. I'm just here going to comment on the um, uh, on the law in section 20. Should the agent include their fees on the statement of estimates? Um, no harm in doing that, uh, but uh, it's not really in terms of qualifying works. It's not really. The, the, the subject of the um, section 20, the actual, um, it, it, because my understanding of the, the section 20 for qualifying works is its comment on the contractor's costs and, and maybe any overheads as well, uh, rather than, in addition, the agents, um, a chance to comment on the uh, agents' fees maybe for uh, procuring those works and overseeing them. Right. 
um, carried out Section 20 procedure on qualifying work for damp penetration to a property. Specification of works agreed and lowest estimate chosen. However, due to three month delay caused by following the Section 20 process, the damp problem had grown considerably worse and therefore the cost given in the tender, including a small contingency, did not cover the work. Do you have to go through the process again, or can you add further work costs onto the tender that has been priced and agreed? It's an interesting one, uh, because it's um, basically one gives an estimate, it's an estimate of, of the, for, the, for the work that one engages in. Uh, as long as the work that's ultimately going to be done. It's not radically different from that in the notice of intent. Uh, I can't see that you'd have to um, follow the Section 20 process again. But our, our philosophy is, uh, if in doubt, consult or seek a dispensation order. If you use the same company for gardening and cleaning, but the two eight areas, when different areas, when broken down, do not go over £100 per leaseholder. Should you issue the, sec the Section 20? Um, I, I'm not sure I can really advise that. I, I, I can happily discuss that one with you online. Off, offline, I I'm maybe have to do some research into that. Uh, but it strikes me, I think you're looking into a qualifying long term agreement. The issue is one looks at the accounting period. Um, uh, over the, over the year, uh, are they? I, I I take it that this is not an employee. This is a separate contractor and not somebody under a contract of employment. Are there particular difficulties, considerations for head lessees serving Section 20 notices on sub lessees in respect of head landlords' works? Can I just clarify? The the situation I believe you're referring to is where a freeholder has wants to carry out major works, costs will be passed on to the head leaseholder, who in turn will have to uh, pass those costs on to an under lessee. Uh, the legislation, uh, regrettably, doesn't engage with that situation. One has to come to a practical solution to that. That's it. But, but it does create difficulties because the um, freeholder may give 30 days and no more, the relevant period, for the head landlord to comment on the freeholder's work, then the head landlord's got to serve a notice uh, on the um, under lessee. Um, would they have to give less than 30 days to be in a position for the head landlord to respond to the notice they got from the freeholder? That's the answer for that, it would be for the freeholder to serve the under lessees as well, of which they're aware, but I'm happy to discuss that with you off, off, offline. Right, let me just have a look, see if there's any more. Um, Estate lighting electricity £40, block lighting electricity £40, lift electricity £40 equals £110. So I take we're talking about qualifying long term agreement. £110. Consult if one utility company. What if lift has different utility company and bills are split? Still need to consult? I don't know whether the managing agent is advising me on this one, but I'm, as I said, I'm happy to talk this one through. It's quite an interesting. Um, uh, situation. I'm not sure if I quite understood all, all, all the various complexities in it, uh, but certainly if, if one is engaging under one agreement uh, and any one leaseholder is going to have to pay more than £110 in any accounting period under that agreement, then it's consult or, or get dispensation. Can't see any more questions. Let me see. Ah, oh, um, right. I'm going to wait maybe another two or three minutes for people to send in questions. So do take advantage. Although you know where to find me anyway, or any of my colleagues. If you want to ring up afterwards, you'll 
drop in an email should anything come to mind after this uh, webinar has concluded. Somebody's put in, I've missed the question about the gardener and cleaner. Um, well, this webinar will be available to be heard afterwards, or we can discuss it uh, on the telephone. Ah, here's a question. Um, we're going to go from right to manage, uh, and now a section 20 notice has been served. Uh, once you serve the claim notice, will that stop the um, the right to manage claim notice? Will that stop the section 20 going ahead? Well, it, the section 20 notice doesn't freeze everything. Sorry, the, the right to manage claim notice doesn't freeze anything. Everything. Um, it um, basically it can progress the the, the consultation process. Uh, up to the acquisition day, after the acquisition day, I can't see how the landlord can continue with it uh, or continue with the works um, because they'll no longer have the management function. Even if you haven't got a question, do feel free to chip in with any experiences you've had. <coughs> right, I'll uh, wait another minute. I um, can't see any more questions. Ah, do you need to consult again if there's a variation in the contract terms of a QLPA, e.g. increase in price? Uh, what I'd like to know is a little bit more information. Was it mentioned in the original QLPA proposal uh, about any price fluctuations? Because that, that's the sort of information that, that, that should be in uh, the uh, proposal. Uh, somebody's asked me a question. Um, how, how long does it take to get um, a hearing, a dispensation application heard by the tribunal? I, I, I should imagine that, that each tribunal varies in terms of its listing arrangements and, and speed of uh, getting these things done. But, but I, it, what's prudent to do is early on get a contact name, somebody you're dealing with, maybe a clerk of the, to the panel, um, who you can have regular communication with and impress upon them the urgency uh, for getting it onto a hearing. Uh, and by all means, the best way, particularly if it's urgent, is to get buy-in from the leaseholders, get their agreement and, and to go for a paper hearing. Uh, somebody sent a, a, a question. What are your views regarding Section 20 waiver notices? I'm not not sure what a waiver notice is, but I'd like to be enlightened. So um, I, I got the name of the person who, who sent in the question. Then most likely I'll come back to them this afternoon if you're around. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll wait another minute.
Are there any maximum time limits between each notice? We consulted last year, but the planning application took so long, the leaseholders stopped the process at intention stage. Now want to revise. Um, well, there aren't any time limits laid down, maximum or otherwise, laid down by the legislation. Um, but I did mention that the, the Jaruzemski and uh, Westminster City Council case, uh, which indicated, although it wasn't the main crux of the uh, determination by the upper tribunal, but they indicated that, the, that there should not be a long gap between the notice of intent and the work uh, being carried out, and otherwise there's a likelihood the notice of intention would be found to be invalid. Certainly I think it would, it would undermine a, a notice of intention if the notice of estimates is a long time afterwards. And, and do keep a watch to make sure that the, um, there isn't a, a departure from what was originally intended uh, when the notice of intention uh, was served. Right, I think that is going to be it um, for today. Um, Thanks very much for listening. You've been a terrific audience uh, and supplied me with lots of uh, challenging questions, uh, given food for thought. And as I said, um, I, I'm going to be around today and I'm going to be around tomorrow as well if you want to get in touch with me. Um, and if you can't get hold of me, speak to any of my colleagues about Section 20. Uh, I've put up on the screen uh, a short survey uh, for you to complete. And um, I've advise you of the forthcoming training, do do feel free to book for the webinar I'm going to be doing on varying leases uh, next Tuesday. And once again, thank you very much for listening.